Uh, it is a deep honor to be here and be able to bring uh, the conversation of cast and tech into the larger conference proceedings, particularly because this is something that I think, as someone who's been attending um, symposiums related to um, technology for almost 15 years, it was a dream of mine that we'd be able to normalize this conversation, and I think that we are here. So it's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm so conscious of the fact that we are having this conversation in the wake of multiple violences and so just wish people much care as we go into our conversation today. So with that I'm actually going to share my screen and um, we'll go ahead and um, uh, present my opening slide deck. But again, the conversation that I want to talk with everybody here today is about how do we understand um, caste and tech and, and really view the examination of the system of exclusion within big tech as a terrain for both tremendous amounts of violence, but also deep resilience and resistance. Because I think that <clears throat> while we have a very rich and robust conversation about the ways that we understand um, racialization and big tech, we are just beginning to have a global conversation of how the axis of caste is as significant of um, uh, an axis to examine as race um, in these conversations. And for folks that are new to the conversation about caste and would like to have a little bit more definitions that we can work from, you know, caste is a system of exclusion that has its origins uh, in 2000 BC. And, you know, it's based on a social fiction, you know, much like the way that race is. And in this system that was based in scripture, it set up a group of people at the top who um, basically decided that every profession would have differing ranks of spiritual purity. And, um, and you know, one's caste would then determine every aspect of their life from uh, their jobs, where they live, whom they, wear, the, they marry and where they worship. It in essence really defines um, your entire life. And it's one of the reasons those of us who are caste depressed refer to it not often as the caste system, but actually caste apartheid, because it often splits the geography of our homelands where, you know, caste depressed people or Dalits are living in um, these separate neighborhoods siloed away from other communities. That, you know, as we kind of look at, you know, caste as a system of exclusion that operates in tech, it's really important to understand that the way that caste operates as a protected category in these non-discrimination clauses is that it refers to, you know, all communities that are discriminated on the base of descent and work. So it refers, of course, to the original system, which was found in South Asia, um, but there are similar systems of hierarchy that exist in South America, and Africa. And so you, you, you're starting to see a global conversation between these communities who's, who experience discrimination based on birth, work, and descent. And all of those folks are kind of entering challenging spaces within um, big tech. <clears throat> And I think that, you know, you know, you'd be surprised the how often we will be in a meeting with a big tech company and they still will not be quite sure what it means to talk about someone who is South Asian American. So I also always start with that definition as well. So in the United States, when we're talking about people who've been racialized as South Asian Americans, we're talking about American immigrants whose heritage comes from any of the countries of South Asia. So this can include Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar. It also includes people who were indentured from their communities before there were nation states in South Asia. So that can include Indo-Caribbean communities or Indo-Fijian communities or Indo-African communities. And all of these migrants, um, particularly in American tech companies, come into the flow um, of uh, a company's culture and you know, often bring caste or create caste dynamics um, in any of the institutions that they may be a part of. And just to kind of give you a picture of why caste is so significant, 
you know, with 1.9 billion people in the world living under a caste system that's essentially um, <coughs> one, in, one in four people live under a caste system and there are 5.7 million South Asian Americans. So it's significant in terms of the global landscape, but it's also significant in terms of the United States. And this is one of the reasons why my organization, Equality Labs, has been raising the issue of caste in uh, the South Asian diaspora and the very practical forms of discrimination that we're seeing um, here in um, American institutions. And to give you a little bit of the sense of the logic of caste, you know, I wanted to kind of just, you know, share this slide that gives you a sense of the hierarchy, because as I mentioned, the scripture set up this level of graded purity between all of these different um, castes and essentially professions um, that are laid out um, in terms of uh, the, the caste pyramid. So at the top, you have people who are the Brahmin priests. You then have those that are the warriors or the Kshatriyas. You have the merchants who are the Vaishyas and the Shudras who are the peasants. And one thing that is really significant um, about this pyramid is that the higher up you go, the more that knowledge production and intellectual work is hoarded by a very few. And then those at the bottom, particularly those that are the excluded castes, which you know the people who are outside of this pyramid are the Dalit castes and also the indigenous or Adivasi communities, they are seen as spiritually defiling, you know, so my community who was formerly known as untouchable, we were seen as spiritual criminals because of some things that we may have done in a past life. And they were forced into illiter uh, illiteracy and also, you know, made to do backbreaking labor, things that were seen as despicable and disgusting and, um, and therefore we should not be touched because to touch us would be to be spiritually defiled. And, um, and the Adivasis and indig indigenous people were seen as caste depressed because they weren't even incorporated in the system. So this is one of the foundational frameworks in understanding um, epistemic injustice inside of the South Asian context because knowledge is hoarded at the top. The people who wrote laws, the people who are allowed to build knowledge uh, were the Brahmins and, you know, and at times, of course, the Kshatriyas. People who are from my caste were actually even forbidden to read or even speak the language um, that laws were written in. And in fact, if we did, our tongues would be cut off or lead would be poured into our ears. So the fact that knowledge is so severely divided um, within um, the, you know, societies that are defined by caste has ramifications for today, because what we're seeing is that, you know, caste as a system of exclusion really tends to hoard resources like access to opportunities for advancement, ownership of land or water, education and employment. You have the small amount of the privilege hoarding the greatest amount of access, while those at the bottom um, are actually deeply struggling in terms of access. And many of these dynamics um, are ported from the practical world into uh, the digital realm. And I think an important term for folks who may not have heard of this um, system to really kind of start to grapple with is this idea of Brahmanism. And just like we would not talk about anti-Blackness without talking about white supremacy, Brahmanism is actually the animating ideology that established the caste system. And it's often used by South Asian theorists to talk about the ways that we see caste recreated in multiple domains. So for example, just like people in the United States say things like white heteropatriarchy, um, the context of caste and gender is often referred to as Brahminical patriarchy. So it, these terms might feel unfamiliar, but as you start to grapple with caste, it's very, you know, this term Brahmanism is a very, very important term to kind of use. And in fact, even for folks that are engaged in decolonial projects in the South Asian context, we often say before we decolonize, we have to de-Brahmanize because our first hegemonic dominating system was actually Brahmanism and the establishment of caste. 
So again, you know, I'm hoping that in this conversation, I'll be introducing you to some new terms that you can then start to use with your other um, analysis of intersectionality as you kind of go forward um, in your own work. Now, you know, in talking a little bit about who are Dalits, um, I wanted to flag that, you know, we are the we are the caste oppressed within this system. And being branded untouchable, it was deeply painful because part of the argument there is that, you know, we are so spiritually defiling to other people, we don't even have a place before God. And that's a tremendous thing to say about anybody. And so part of the reclamation of our dignity has been you know, eschewing that term and calling ourselves Dalit, asserting ourselves as caste depressed um, and using, you know, we might identify it as part of different religions. We want to do everything in order to escape and reclaim our humanity and, um, and escape the violent caste apartheid that has separate neighborhoods and places of worship and schools. And, you know, oftentimes I think people can look at the punishing data of how underdeveloped we are in South Asia, but I think it's really important to know that caste is here in the United States. And while it's not as widespread and overt as it is in South Asia, it exists here too. And it's primarily um, seen in American workplaces through severe uh, discrimination. And to give you a sense of some of the things that we're seeing here, you know, uh, Equality Labs, my organization conducted one of the first surveys establishing CAST in North America. And, you know, it was pretty shocking because at the time, very few scholars wanted to study this issue. We had plenty of anecdotal information that severe discrimination was occurring. Um, but when we finally got the results back from our survey, we were we were just shocked because we found one in four Dalits who responded to our survey said that they had faced physical and verbal assault based on their caste. One in three Dalit students had reported being discriminated against during their education, and two out of three reported being treated unfairly in their workplace. And just those three first data points um, shocked many people because we have one of the highest rates of uh, discrimination over any Asian American group um, in our in our section. And, and it was funny because when I would share this data with people, they'd be like, oh yeah, this is in India, right? And I said, no, this is in the United States. And the stories that accompanied this data were really harrowing. You know, because we had heard of, you know, Dalit students that had been targeted for sexual assault on their campuses. We had heard of, you know, Dalits who had faced, you know, attacks with like, you know, weapons um, in the parking lots of religious institutions. And the things were so severe, but because there wasn't enough caste equity or competency in many institutions, people weren't reporting what was happening. And in fact, they were actually hiding in the closet. And so one of the other startling data points that came out of our work was that one in two Dalits basically said they were so terrified at what could happen if they came out that they preferred to live in the closet. And that happened to my family. My family like lived in the closet for many years. And it was one of the reasons why I've been so committed around the work of caste equity and civil rights is because I don't want anyone to go through what my family had to deal with in terms of living in the closet. I mean, my dad only came out at the age of 24 um, as a Dalit because of the fear he had from you know, his, his peers. So these are very seri serious issues and it's not about just hurt feelings, it's about structural unlawful discrimination, which is why we need to act on it. Um, uh, in a very serious way. And, and, you know, I know that there's a lot of folks that are always interested in like one, what does it look like in South Asia? And I just wanted to give you guys like a quick snapshot of what we're seeing. But what you look in this data is that essentially, you know, Dalits face, you know, extreme underdevelopment. We have the highest levels of literacy, the highest levels of poverty. We also um, do not own land and there's extreme violence so that there's crimes that are happening every hour against Dalit people. 
And, and in many ways, the reasons why we're not talking about it as a global community is because of how taboo it is to talk about caste and how much control the dominant castes have in terms of platforms of knowledge building and the media. And it's only because of social media that we've started to hear global voices listen and hear from Dalit people directly. Um, and this is why we're in this moment now of reckoning um, related to caste. And in some ways, I think that part of what I want to really just undergird here is that there's a way that we can deal with the problems of caste discrimination to shifts in policy. But what is also happening is, you know, a recognition of the intergenerational trauma that caste has, you know, inflicted on South Asian people and how to have authentic conversations related to reconciliation across um, caste bias and lines. And I bring this up because you may be in a field where you're interacting with different South Asians. Some of them may have wildly different opinions about this because of where they might be around the caste line. And that's okay. This is what happens when, you know, a community faces a reckoning around um, a system as violent as caste that has operated as long as caste and has had very little global accountability. And so for anyone that is like observing this from the outside, you know, you are really seeing a historical opening um, that has been pushed by caste oppressed movements um, around the world to really have this be a defining axis of understanding South Asia, but also how to understand South Asians interacting with global institutions. And just to give you a sense of some of the severity of the cases that we're talking about, I'm just going to give you a snapshot of some of the um, places that we've seen this operate in the United States. So in Berkeley, we had a landlord um, named Lucky Bali Reddy, who trafficked over 300 workers. And this was actually one of the first schemes where H-1B visas were used to traffic um, people. Um, they were said to be tech workers. And in fact, they were Dalit workers that he was enslaving to work in his buildings, 20 of whom were young girls who were his sex slaves. And this case was horrific. It was in the year 2000. And, you know, and again, he's the second largest landlord in the city of Berkeley. And so many students lived in those buildings and were watching these trafficked workers. And ultimately he was brought down because um, one of the young girls that was his sex slaves um, died in one of his apartments and they rolled her body into a rug and tried to bring it out into the street. And the workers, dumped the rug out, they, it slipped and her body rolled out in public view and bystanders then called the police and so began an investigation that led to his ultimate prosecution. But the thing that was so interesting is that at all steps of the prosecution, you know, whether it was at the city level, at the federal level, people were just not equipped to understand how much impunity a company's cast. So they had difficulty finding places for the young women to stay because nobody wanted to counter him. They had difficulty finding interpreters. And ultimately, um, you know, the this guy, Lucky Bali Reddy, you know, hired violent gunmen to try to track them down and intimidate people and intimidate their families back at home uh, to try to prevent justice from prevailing. But this case is so significant because it's that first case that kind of established caste in the United States. We also have ongoing cases around the country connected to the BAPS Temple Circuit where again, workers were trafficked and paid $1.20 an hour to build Hindu temples um, across the country. Their passports were seized. Uh, they were not allowed to use the, the rest of the facilities um, in terms of bathrooms and where people cooked. And these brave workers came forward and whistleblowed on the conditions. And they're now in the middle of a traffic, you know, class action suit um, against these places. And, you know, it's a, it's a really horrific um, kind of working condition and, you know, in direct violation with some of the unionization of the building trades. And so this case is currently making its way through the courts as is the Cisco case, which is really the watershed case that opened up this conversation of cast and tech, which happened in 2000, where the state of California's Department of Fairness and Employment and Housing 
um, investigated and found that Cisco had um, created a Castus hostile workplace for one of its workers. And this case is currently in litigation, but the worker at the heart of it alleged um, that not only was his identity outed at work, but once people knew his identity, he was siloed and eventually fettered off for termination after facing a harassing workplace related to bullying and um, isolation because of caste. And, and again, you know, this, these are cases that are going to be determined by the courts, but what it actually unleashed in the United States was a conversation about what in fact was happening in terms of tech and its cast oppressed workers and hundreds of workers came out to us we had close to 260 reports within the first two weeks of people that had experienced um you know caste discrimination and this began like a very deep uh, investigation in terms of our work um, to really support tech workers who are facing um, systemic discrimination um, in the industry and, and I think that one of the things that's really important for people, especially for other researchers looking at bias in tech, is that, you know, we often think um, about the terms of racialization and how that um, has really played a role in terms of how people of color um, are engaging with tech companies. But I think what's also important is that South Asians may have been racialized, um, you know, under white supremacy, but our internal hegemonies are just as powerful in terms of the biases that we bring when we come to other um, institutions. And wherever South Asians have gone around the world, they have brought cast. And it's showing up in institutions around the country from universities, corporations, and social service organizations. And in terms of tech, it's you know, impacting employees, products, and users. And that's been a bulk of our civil rights advocacy with big tech is really to first make the issue of caste legible, and then really work with companies and their workers to try to make the workplaces safer and, um, and begin to kind of ferret out bias in the products wherever it might be. And <clears throat> if you remember that term, uh, Brahmanism that I used earlier, you know, digital Brahmanism is a framework that we've introduced um, in our work at Equality Labs, which refers to the reorganization of caste in the digital space. And again, it might have impacts in terms of the workplace, in terms of the products or in terms of its user base, but more and more we want to really understand um, how we're seeing <clears throat> caste operate within um, the 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 this space in order to be able to address it meaningfully so we're not reinscribing caste for an entirely new generation and just to give you a sense of like how we're seeing the concentration of power this is a list of you know some of the top indian ceos who um, run some of the most, you know, highest valued tech companies um, in the world today. Many of them come from dominant caste backgrounds. And I think just like we would ask questions of any other CEO about how their implicit and explicit biases inform their, their understandings of stewardship related to diversity and equity, we have to also ask these questions related to caste um, of these CEOs, <clears throat> because many of these, um, many of the dominant caste leadership that has come into management and into the C-suite of companies, they've gotten there because of affirmative action. They are there because the you know companies desire to have diverse looking um, uh, and diversity, you know, diversity in terms of background, in terms of their staffing. However. Um, you know, many of these folks pull the ladder behind them because they are there certainly because of wanting to have a diverse professional workforce, but their, their alignment is not really about equity. And I think that's where we can get more insight about their political positions related to all BIPOC communities by better understanding how caste bias might be informing racial bias. And you know, to start with kind of that first pillar I spoke about, which was about workforce, um, I think one of the things that I've seen over and over again with workers, especially since most tech workers that are cast depressed are H-1B uh, visa holders, 
they're often afraid to report to HR because they feel that HR does, you know, lacks the competency. And we're not even talking about competency related to caste. We're talking about competency even to like where, you know, South Asia is as a region. And I always remember what this worker said to me is like, why would I ever report to HR where they probably don't even know where India is on the map? And, and what this reflects is that American companies that have global, re, um, global workforces really have HR professionals that are not trained to understand um, hierarchies across the world. Their, their model of discrimination and hierarchy is primarily that of race. And so they haven't caught up with the challenges of um, the local, um, local workforces based in South Asia and also the flow of employees across um, all those different regions. So not only are the HR professionals um, needing more training, but also the policies themselves are really piecemeal. So take for, a com uh, take for example, a company like Google, Google might have cast as a protected category in its South Asian markets, but it's exempt in its US markets. However, their teams are intentionally transnational. So you might have a manager in their Hyderabad office managing teams in, you know, with individuals in the UK and the US and Australia. So all of the ways that we understand jurisdiction when it comes to managing employees and employment law really um, haven't kept up with the actual flow of capital and, um, and employees that these multinationals are creating for their products. And we know that in India, because we actually have no data related to caste and corporate structure and caste and tech, because very few companies actually have caste as a protected category. But we know that from the Indian context, you know, you know, surveys are really dismal when it comes to caste equity. So, for example, the top 1,000 Indian corporations have a diversity score of zero when it comes for diversity in terms of the board composition. So, you know, the majority of Indian corporations have boards made up of dominant caste people. And, <clears throat> and in another survey by the Confederation of Indian Industry, even attempts to collect data are boycotted. So 95% of the people that you know were reached out to did not respond. And the 5% did said that if caste depressed people or Dalits were hired, they were only employed at the lower levels and as unskilled labor, certainly not at management. And so I think that, you know, when we, again, we're having Indian talent that is trained in India, in a caste environment, coming into operations with implicit and explicit bias, they recreate those dynamics inside of American corporations. And, you know, my experience with this really came last year um, where I was, you know, April for, you know, people who may not know is Dalit History Month. And <clears throat> this, is an, uh, this is a project that I had co-founded with other Dalit feminists. And so, you know, usually in the month of April, we do a lot of talks. There's a lot of celebration of Dalit contributions to history. It's, you know, it's, it's really, you know, a very normal thing to celebrate at this time. And um, Google had, um, Google News Division had invited me to give a talk about caste equity in the newsroom. Again, fairly banal, particularly because I had already spoken um, about caste. Ironically, at Google News was that just as, you know, like a couple of days before the event was supposed to go live, there was a group of dominant caste bigots that mobilized using the employee resource group function inside those companies, wrote in saying that if the speaker talks, I am afraid for my life. This cannot happen because the discussion of caste is Hindu phobic, you know, basically positioning caste equity as against a particular religion. And, you know, and it, it was like we were racking our heads about it, and especially with Tunuja Gupta, who was, you know, a very, that was the senior manager under um, Google News and who was also one of the leaders of the Google walkout. You know, we were just laughing because, you know, as far as we knew, nobody had ever died from a DEI talk. And yet <laughs> that was the assertion um, of the opponents to this conversation. And this escalated to the point where several staff that had been involved with trying to uh, bring this conversation forward were targeted. And Tunisia herself kept advocating for this issue until she was kind of, you know, dealing with some unbelievable resistance. 
And then she publicly resigned and shared her experiences of what had happened. And, um, and this really exposed how big the bias problem um, uh, it was in terms of Google. And it was another watershed moment of people talking about cast in tech. And I think just to kind of give you a sense of how people talk, I think that it's really important to understand that the casteism that happens isn't just in verbal conversations, it's in message boards, it's in supervision, it's in all of the textures and touch points um, within, between workers inside companies. So, you know, here's something that comes from one of the boards that we saw where people are making fun of the English, um, you know, capacities of Dalit staff. They're also diminishing their experiences and saying that, you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, um, that they should go back home and even go back to mommy Mayavadi, which is referring back to a Dalit politician back home. Um, here, they're saying things like, you know, you want to get rid of the caste system, you know, you get anarchy. So, and are you also a BLM supporter? So there's a lot of anxiety of people who are dominant caste, who equate caste oppressed people speaking out with, um, you know, black movements. And in fact, they'll use things like this is a woke ideology to be talking about caste. They'll even use terms like this is like critical caste theory versus critical race theory. So a lot of offensive you know, commentary like this. And this is the tamer stuff. I didn't include the more violent stuff, but this is very normalized. And we've seen it across every major tech company um, in reports uh, from workers across the, the board. Um, and I think that, you know, for people that are interested in this, they should really, you know, pick up the work by Ajanta Subramaniam, The Cast of Merit, which talks about how castist institutions in terms of educational institutions like <clears throat> the Indian Institutes of India really have very deeply casteist practices that create casteist alumni networks that then get a, um, that then are the pools of recruitment for tech talent in the United States. And I think that's also one of the challenges with caste is that it becomes these very deeply tied, hard to penetrate professional networks um, that processes like internal referral um, where you know existing employees can refer new employees really then help to consolidate and create hegemonic um, uh, departments that are made up solely of one particular caste or one particular regional set of castes. And these are the kinds of things that we've heard workers complain of. Common usage of caste slurs, bullying and harassment, disparate salaries or benefits, you know, attempts to out people's caste identity, because again, here, caste is operating very similar to sexual orientation, where, you know, there's not necessarily something that is visible that shows that someone is caste depressed, unless people start to share caste locators. So people often will hide because they don't want to be outed. Um, and then we also see things like demotion, termination, caste-based sexual um, harassment, and, um, and, and worse. So I think that you don't have to be an expert in caste to know that these are significant problems and there needs to be a remedy. And you can see that, you know, this is some data that's coming out of a, an upcoming survey that we've done around caste and tech, is that um, you can see that they're the out of the things that we've reported, these are the most commonly reported forms of caste-based discrimination. So unfair peer, peer reviews, um, you know, the outing, as we mentioned, but also something that might be new for people is negative remarks on reservation. And um, this is something I think that's really important to pay attention to is that in India, the affirmative action policy that helped to support caste oppressed people because of historical violence is called the reservation system because you're reserving seats or quotas um, in different government or university institutions for those who come from caste depressed backgrounds. So the generation of technologists that have come uh, to American tech are of a generation that really hated that affirmative action policy. So a lot of times, even though they themselves are here because of affirmative action in the United States, their first comment is always about, I 
All right. So what we're seeing now is that biased companies create biased tech. And this has been one of the other pieces of advocacy we've had to really drive home in terms of our work at Equality Labs. And, you know, I think one of the first big incidences that we experienced was you know, um, we had been working for a long time to get cast as a protected category in terms of moderation. And, you know, in that work, we had created different posters and had shared them like in both South Asia and the United States. And there was a crucial meeting where Twitter was meeting with women journalists where someone gave them one of our posters. And there's a poster that had this image that said smash for medical patriarchy. patriarchy. Um, and this was a post that, um, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Jack Dorsey was holding up. Up and it just launched all hell uh, because, you know, this was for the first time a white CEO of a tech company acknowledging caste and gender. And this drove dominant caste people mad. And it led to, you know, headlines all around the world because blasphemy charges were put against Twitter. Um, and all of a sudden people were talking about what on earth is caste and gender and Brahminical patriarchy. And there was tons of trolling and, you know, Hindu nationalist attacks against myself and uh, the, this entire conversation, um, but it also led to one of the first op-eds um, in the New York Times about the lack of moderation. And through this advocacy, you know, we have been able to finally push Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook to get cast as a moderation policy. But if you want to think about how ludicrous it is, is that it's taken, you know, this extensive level of intervention, um, you know, for all of these companies, India is now the largest market. And even though they've hired Indians, they actually still lack very deep uh, competencies related to dangerous speech and caste and religious minorities. And that's really led to an acceleration of violence on the platform that's really brought the country to the point of genocide. And, and this is where I think when we start to think about caste and tech is that, you know, because bias companies create bias products, we have to think about the global accountability measures that exist where the lack of enforcement of their own guidelines and even the laws related to danger speech, to speech in those jurisdictions has now led to the conditions for mass atrocity. And what do we as a global community want to do around that failure? And, you know, some of the results of that lack of competency has included, you know, some the 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 normalization of slurs. And this is like some of the, uh, the content that I receive regularly. Um, there's also like, you know, these kind of absurd conversations around critical race theory and critical caste theory. And you often see some of the most bigoted anti black messages coupled with anti dalit messages where you're seeing right-wing ideologies kind of meet in these social media spheres. Um, and you'll also see openly genocidal conversation. And I wanna give you know, a, um, a, a trigger warning here, but you know, one of the things that has been deeply frustrating as we've been trying to work with these companies to address their castes and religious um, biases is the fact that they allow um, hate speech against protected minorities, especially minorities that are dealing with genocide, um, you know, crap like this. You know, there should never be a situation where we're seeing Rohingya disinformation because all of the companies said after the Rohingya genocide, they wouldn't allow this content. Yet this happens every day. And even this horrific image of multiple Muslims being um, hung, this is not only coming from a major political party, the BJP, which is the Hindu nationalist ruling party in the country, um, it was allowed on many different platforms and not stopped until outrage came as a result. So what we're seeing is that the, the, the biased products that are coming out of this aren't just small incursions into bias, they're, they're leading to the disruption of democracy in one of the largest regions um, of the world. And to give you a sense of like how dangerous the environment is in India right now, 
you know, we have, you know, in 2019, the passage of the Citizenship Amendment Act, which set up this entire genocidal project where, you know, um, millions are slated um, to be denaturalized because of this really absurd provision of, you know, religious, you know, uh, foundations for who is considered a citizen or not. And this law targets primarily Indian Muslims, but will impact many caste oppressed people as well. And there's already many you know, internment camps that are already built and millions of people already incarcerated. So this is very serious consequences for the foundations of how tech might be complicit with this genocidal project. And it's something that we absolutely need more scholarship on, more insight on, and one that understands how the biases of caste and religion really play a role um, in their contributing to violence. Um, we're also seeing bans um, against minority handles. Um, this is like an embed cried or a cast depressed handle that is pretty common. And they come from groups that are openly mobilizing on these platforms with the specific job to take people down. So this is one of them, it's called like Hindu IT cell. And you see they go after tenured professors like Professor Audrey Truchke, where they'll, they'll not only celebrate taking her down, they'll mention all of the volunteers that are involved in that process. And even though such action is actually against the platform's rules, reporting this doesn't deal with anything because again, they lack the competency and they're not interested in stopping um, casteist and religious hate speech and actions. They're actually making money off of this violence. And then I also think there's a whole game around verifications. And, you know, of course, with the new ownership of Elon Musk, this has taken an even more crazier turn. But I think the challenge with verifications is it sets up a factual um, dilemma where people are using verifications to try to lift their voices above disinformation. But the people, the overwhelming people who are verified on the platform are people who are dominant caste, who come from, um, you know, who are coming from or are part of these nationalist networks. And uh, caste minorities and religious minorities just don't have the same amount of community community influencers that are verified. So disinformation through the usage of verification is given a higher weight than community discourse of you know, similar influencers if they were in real life, which becomes a real problem when platforms like Twitter are used to mobilize for pogroms uh, the way it happened in Delhi in 2019. And I, I think that these are very dark things, but I, I don't want to end on a dark thing because we are in a very powerful moment of uh, the rise of the caste equity movement. And this is a movement that is really driven by the idea that in order to heal from caste, we must first, you know, name that it's a problem, address it in policy, and begin the process of reconciliation because we're authentically moving through this issue. And we're coming off some very powerful wins coming into this session where the city of Seattle just passed um, the first um, law that makes uh, cast part of the non-discrimination policy of any city in North America, which is quite powerful. And I think that the really crucial thing about it is that some of the core people involved in this work were tech workers. And particularly from that experience that I talked about with Google, you know, after um, I was deplatformed and Tunisia resigned, you know, the Alphabet Workers Union, you know, has been tirelessly campaigning for Google to add caste as a protected category. And the thing that was remarkable about the Seattle win is that while Google has still not added caste, the workers in Google are transforming the jurisdiction, jurisdiction that they work in to get caste added there where their, their power is extending beyond their union and into the places that they live. And so it's been an incredible journey to see all the different worker power that has gone into these campaigns that were mobilized by Dalit feminist leaders um, like myself and our organization at Equality Labs. So at this moment, we have close to 100 institutions across the country that have added CAS as a protected category, including the Cal State University system. And what we see is that it's worker power and unions with student organizations and movements, with racial and gender justice movements, and um, Dalit feminist uh, and Dalit organizations like um, Equality Labs. 
And, you know, the thing that is, I think, a very powerful beacon of hope here is that while we are up against a very difficult, bigoted right wing, the answer to dealing with that right wing was intersectional feminist politics. And so by kind of bringing all of the folks into a big tent coalition to be able to mobilize, we were able to win. And we are keeping that commitment to win as we take on more and more campaigns. So I want to I want to leave that as that optimistic place that we can um, really, you know, have more conversations about because, again, I think for all of us who are researching the the deep intersectional divides that kind of um, operate within uh, the fields of um, tech that we might be examining, there is always resilience and possibility when we're rooted in intersectional feminist um, and caste and racial ethical politics. And, and to see that being transformed by movements that are intentionally moving in such ways is remarkable, um, especially as we see caste um, and tech uh, just growing as a conversation and, um, and a greater examination existing about its manifestations across uh, many pillars within tech. Um, so with that, I wanted to pass it back to the moderator so that we can go into Q&A.